So we deal, you remember, we, we started with depiction of, of childhood, how ch children were represented in, in art, in, and in Canadian art. And then we went to adulthood last time. And of course, the obvious subject after that is old age. And uh, that's, I thought of dividing my subject into two sections. One today uh, dealing with uh, old men and next time uh, with women. And you will see, I think the, the problem of each uh, team is very different. Uh, I've been treated very differently with other type of motivation. And so today, old age, but on the masculine side. And the first question you have to ask it is, uh, if you go to heart history and try to find out a little bit uh, uh, an angle, let's say, to, to deal with this, this, what was the motivation of painters to represent old people? Uh, um, speaking of old men, one of the obvious uh, motivation was to uh, deal with the predecessor uh, and to show, for instance, some respect or homage to a father or to uh, a master also. Uh. And uh, then also you had the other motivation when it was the painter himself who was representing himself as an old man. It was to show that he was still in control of his craft. Uh, and uh, even if he's very aged, he could still make a, a very good self-portrait of himself, for instance. This I will call the whole narcissism <laughs> syndrome, let's say, a little bit, anyway. So the first example uh, that I will use from art history is, is interesting because it combines the two motivations in a way, because it's uh, like the Italian uh, title will give you right away what it is, autoritrato, so self-portrait, uh, del pittore, of the painter, in atto di dipingere suo padre, in the act of uh, depicting his own father. Uh, so then, you see the, uh, the younger man there is, is a painter painting his father. And it happens also that the father of this Luca Gambiazzo was also his master. So then in this picture, you could say, well, he gave homage to both, to, to the father and also to his teacher. Uh, and that's probably why the brush of the painter touched his lips, because if he's a teacher, he used words, and uh, so he could, he could stress that way, let's say that he was also his teacher. But since the similarity between the two guys is so amazing, <laughs> so amazing that he creates a kind of strange double self-portrait in a way. Huh? It's him, but it looks also him as he, as he will look when he will be uh, older. You know? And it creates, of course, a feeling of the passage of time between the two portraits, if you want. The drawing I put on the right, it is uh, just to give you an idea of who was this Luca Cambiazzo. He was not the most famous of painter, I guess. Um, he was famous in Genoa in the 16th century, uh, getting a lot of contract and things. And he was known also for this type of strange uh, drawings where he reduced all the personages he represented in kind of cubist uh, or geometrical shape, if you want. And because of that, sometimes you will see him named as a kind of a real and or very remote ancestor of cubism. You know? And uh, Cambiazzo maybe could be associated with that. And as you can see, uh, an example of, of this type of drawing. So in this case, you have an homage to the father and to the master. And another example, I says also, that another motivation, let's say, was for a, a famous painter like Tiziano, for instance, in this case, to represent himself as an old man and to show to his uh, uh, possible, uh, let's say, uh, uh, patrons that he was still in good shape, he was still able to make a, a rather a powerful type of portrait and of himself. And this is one, he, he had many, but this is one of uh, the famous one who is in, the, in Berlin, in the Stadtlich Museum in Berlin. Uh, what struck me in this painting, it's the gesture of the hand of Tiziano, of the right hand. The one is on the table, if you want, this type of gesture like this. It looks like authoritarian, but it looks also like the gesture of something who will take something from far and bring it to him. 
this is the gesture of greed, in fact. Huh? And in the case of Titiano, we have so many uh, proof of that, it's even embarrassing. You see, for instance, uh, I got through a little bit of uh, some, uh, let's say, contemporary speaking of him, like Giovanni Francesco Agatoni uh, writing to the Duke of Urbino. So the Duke of Urbino is, uh, of course, somebody who could order a painting from Tiziano. Uh, and he says, be careful with him. He does nothing other than demand money. <laughs> right away. Or as have I written to you before, when it comes to money, Titian is the most obstinate man. Uh, and uh, again, there's no one in Venice more greedy for money than Tiziano. Uh, and so he had the reputation of that. And more than that, he used his age also to get more money, uh, saying, for instance, to the king of Spain, Philip IV, uh, in which he worked for seven years on the, on the Last Supper, a huge painting, let's say, representing the Last Supper. He, he worked for seven years on this, and he write to him, okay, you pay me already a lot, but uh, I'm still working on it. You should pay me a little bit more. And then he says, uh, in that way, I will be able to serve you up to my death, huh? meaning that as if it was really the the, the last thing that he will do, maybe the king will be, if ever he, he means his words, it will be wonderful, we will not have to pay him every year, something else. When you read this, you have the, the feeling that he's at the end of his life, and in fact, he will live another 13 years after. The, the letter is in, in 53, I think, and he died in 76, so there's really, uh, there was a lot of time still left to him. But he used his age as a, uh, as a way to get uh, um, more money. Uh, and I, I'm not the, uh, okay, the, the, I, as I said, the contemporary, I've noticed that, but you could see also other painters have noticed it also, like Bassano. Uh, what I show you on the left, it's the full picture if you want, but with a lot of details and difficult to read. And then one little details on the right of the same picture, uh, in which you see, uh, it's the theme of the purification of the temple. You know what it is when Christ come in the temple and chase all the changers of money who are there and push them out. And so one of them is uh, based on Tiziano's portrait. Uh, if you look at him, and it's almost the same type of gesture. So he's old, he's stable, you see, because with his money and uh, because he's scared that Christ will, will chase him with, with the others. Uh. So Jacopo Bessano use uh, the, the face, or if you want, the, the theme of, of uh, the whole self-portrait of Titiano to represent one of the changers of the temple. So I guess he had uh, uh, this kind of bad reputation, not only among his contemporary, but also among some painters, and even, I could add, some poets also. Like Aretino, this is a portrait by Titiano of Aretino, which is a famous Italian poet, I have also complained for the same thing. He says uh, uh, the following, so I just read a translation in a letter. He said, the not small sum of money that Tiziano received and the even greater greed for more is why he gave no heed to the obligation he should have for a friend nor to the duty proper to his family, but, a, but eagerly awaits with a strange intensity only that which promised great things. The things that promise great things is, of course, money. Uh, and uh, he says, my painting would have been better, my portrait would have been better if I had paid more, but I refused, it was enough. And, and so if you look at the vestment, it seems a little bit more sketchy uh, than the face itself. So it's what he means, that he, uh, Tiziano didn't finish the painting because he was not paid properly. Uh, so this, uh, so you, you see uh, very often in self-portrait you have uh, this kind of, uh, uh, unconscious revelation of, of certain aspect of, of the painter. Huh? And, and then, okay, certainly the intention of Tiziano was to show that he's still in power, he's still in control of his, of his uh, craft, of his uh, knowledge of painting, but also he, he suggested something else like you, we could, uh, we, we could uh, substantiate by others, uh, by the documents I show you and by the painting I show you too. What about so Canadian artists uh, uh, having the same type of motivation? Let's say you have a famous uh, portrait of Plamondon, Antoine Plamondon, a self-portrait that he made apparently toward the end of his life. And uh, it was presented recently, well, in 2005, 2006 at the Musée du Québec. They make a, a nice uh, presentation of a Plamondon oeuvre. 
And they reveal at the time that this painting was based on a photograph by Livernois. Uh, Livernois was a photographer of, of Quebec, a very, um, it was a family, in fact, there were many, but let's say uh, uh, this one, uh, the uh, Jules Etienne, uh, Livernois, did a photo of Plamondon, and Plamondon wrote on it his name and his age, 71 years old. Uh, and uh, in fact, he gave, a, he aged himself a little bit. He, he was one year less than that when the photo was taken. Yeah? And uh, so the, the idea was to uh, probably to present himself as a younger man than he was to show that even at 71 or 72, he looks still good. Yeah? That was more or less the, this idea. When I speak of old narcissus, narcissus <laughs> you have another aspect of this. And so he used then this photo to make the, the self-portrait that you have on the left, and in which he wrote on it, uh, Plamondon, 82 ans, uh, 82 years old. So then he, he aged himself even more. Uh. In fact, when he painted that, he was 78, and uh, so he gave himself four more years. And not only he used the photo, but I would say he gave him he gave himself a better look. Huh? He's less, his uh, he's beard is more trim and more neat. Uh, he's dressed with a kind of mantle instead of the, this bad uh, jacket that he have on the photo. Uh, the steely high uh, eyes of, of Plamondon were, were very famous. You see, he, he had this uh, kind of very uh, uh, difficult type of gaze, if you want to, people who were posing from them were, were impressed by this. You remember he made the portrait of these nuns who are all looking down, you know, not trying to face, being afraid to face him. So, um, but in the, in the portrait of, uh, on the left there, it seems more uh, amiable, you know, you have blue eyes instead of these steely gray eyes that we see in other portraits and also in, in, in other photographs. The only uh, new detail there was strange. It is this kind of palette and, and brushes that you see on the foreground that seems to float huh, in midair like this. They are not really on the table. They are uh, situated like this in somewhere. And what uh, Plamondon wanted to suggest that he is no more active as a painter in a way. Maybe that I don't trust him completely on this because he, he wants to show him younger than he is. So maybe being able to be still active, if you want. But on the other hand, he wants to show himself as an old man, very wise now, and having uh, had a brilliant career behind him. So he could uh, be sh seen without hands at first, and with his brush brushes and palette uh, in midair, uh, doing nothing, but with the color uh, well situated on it, ready to be used, in fact. Huh? And uh, indeed, three years after that, the painting, he's still living, and he published this little ad in the uh, Le Courrier du Canada, was a kind of a newspaper of the time, in uh, 1885, in which he says, le grand âge ayant obligé, le sous-signé a déposé le crayon et le pinceau, son atelier est à vendre. Huh? Alors, being very old, my studio is for sale now, and uh, I have a lot of things to, to uh, uh, les plafonds de Versailles, etc. So he have engravings that he want to sell, and also, of course, eventually, maybe his painting, this last one that he have in his studio. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, again, the, this is the same idea, of course, of uh, showing himself as being uh, retiring, let's say, from painting. Yeah. The one aspect of, if you go back to the, uh, no, wait. if you go back to the portrait, uh, the one on the left, one aspect that he could not hide, because even if he wanted to, to show himself as younger than he was, was his wrinkles. Uh, and this will be my first theme about old age. When men are represented as old people, they will have uh, the, the only, the, the things that you have to look at, I would say it's always how the wrinkles are expressed and, and what is the type of meaning that we want to put behind that. There's that and also there's certain gesture you will see that are very often associated also with representation of old men. But this, I, I will come later to that. 
The wrinkle thing is very strange because it was, for a, for a long period, a fascination among people, I would say, of the same nature than chiromancy. Uh, you know what chiromancy is, the, the heart of reading the lines in the, in the hand. Uh? And uh, for the, with the same type of, uh, of, I would say, pseudoscience, because of course, uh, how can you know through the line of, uh, of, of the hand that uh, what will be your future and your fate and all that. With the same type of fascination, you had a, a pseudoscience who was called metoposcopy, uh, in which a uh, wizard will, will tell you from your wrinkles uh, the, uh, what is your future, what is your, uh, your destiny. Yeah? That's probably why women try to uh, erase their wrinkles as much as possible to keep uh, the secret and I don't know. But men are, are naive on this. They, they go with their wrinkles and they, and they get this type of, uh, of uh, treatment, <laughs> let's say. I will show you a little bit what it is. Metoposcopy, you have the word there, come from metope uh, in Greek, and the metope in Greek is a part of, a, of a, let's say, of an architecture. Uh, this is, a, uh, imagine the Parthenon, for instance, the, with the, the kind of triangle uh, shape on the top, and then you have the column, but in between you have a section there. Where is the metope? The metope will be the square uh, piece that you have there that sometimes are uh, illustrated with sculpture like you, you have on, on, on the right. Huh? And uh, so from this word, we mean something like forehead or, or something, uh, uh, part of a facade, if you want, if you speak of architecture, they have created this word metoposcopy of uh, this pseudoscience in which people were able to predict the future. One of these metoscop, <laughs> if I can, metoposcopist, if you want, uh, if I can call him that way, was uh, this uh, Jérôme Cardin. And he published books like this, uh, there are 16 volume of that, with figure, in which you have different type of wrinkles, let's say, and under it, in Latin, he wrote what will happen to a person who have this type of wrinkles and the other. Huh? For instance, I could read you uh, what, uh, is written just below the one on the top in the left. Uh, just to give you an example of the type of uh, bizarre uh, <laughs> remarks that they make. Uh, where is it? It's here. Uh, in which he says, okay, in Latin, cum linea Saturnini. So each line is associated also to a planet. Uh, so there's a line of Saturn, let's see. And he says, cum linea Saturn intersecando linea Jovis. The one line, he says, in this case of this girl on the top there, she have one line from Saturn uh, in, with intersection with the line of uh, Jovis, uh, Jupiter, of course, and Martis, and of Mars. Uh, descended at locum lunae, uh, descending to the uh, place of the moon. So she have in her face all the astrology that you can imagine uh, already. <laughs> And he says, and sic conjungit cumea, and then uh, being uh, all together uh, at the same place, if you want, denotat infamam vitam. He says, when you have this type of combination of wrinkles, this is a bad girl. Infamam vitam, it's not good. Uh, it's an infamous life, if you want, but in, in the sense that uh, morally infamous. Uh, and she says, periculum amitendi oculum sinistrum. Yeah, she is. Um, very, uh, it, it, her life is dangerous because the, the, the left eye, see, then we see the bad eyes, huh? le mauvais oeil, like we say in French also. The, the bad eyes look at her and uh, it could, uh, it could mean that she, she, she would be in trouble. And he concludes, vel cadendi ablatu in aquam, she could even fall in water. Huh? So, uh, so it's fantastic you go, you go to one of these guys and you, you just look at your wrinkles and he, he predict to you what will happen, how you will die, how you will fall in water and things like that. And it goes on and on like this for their 16th volume and 800 picture, 800 little vignettes like that with different type of things. So it was really like a, a kind of a pseudoscience, I would say, a little bit like chiromancia. Huh? And the, um, it was forbidden by the church also because you are not supposed to know the future. Uh, only God knows. And so they were doing that uh, secretly. And Cardin himself, the book was published after his death. And uh, see, th there was a kind of secrecy around this. 
but uh, it, 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 it shows a kind, of a, a, a kind of interest in this aspect of the human face, let's say, that I've been, of course, almost forgotten today. Mind you, I went to, to the internet, because it's always fun to do, with metoposcopy, and I got uh, people who believe in that still today. Yeah, and they, they offer you uh, for a modic sum, uh, for, for a little bit of money, uh, to tell you also your future. And even some of, some of this uh, fantastic person was good also to predict your uh, future through the look at the moles or the uh, spot of, uh, do you say that, spot of beauty? Or beauty spot, uh, les, les grandes beautés, we said in French. And, uh, and this again, you have a chart like this, <laughs> in which they give you all the possibility. Let's say this poor guy, of course, is Finnish. He, he's certainly dead already. But, but then he, all the possibility with little numbers. And then again, uh, this done by uh, an English uh, uh, metoposcope, if you want, the scopist, Saunders. Uh, and physiognomy and chiromancy and metoposcopy, it's really uh, all the, the, the science uh, of the time. Huh? And uh, so again, uh, this, the, so th there is a fascination, I would say, pseudo-scientific of this, and it's not astonishing also that artists will be tempted to, uh, to go in that direction or to try to do this uh, in their way. I, I'm not, uh, I will not dare to go as far as going back to the portrait of Plamono and trying to find what it was his future according to metoposcopy. But it could be a nice exercise to do to try to see uh, what, what, what could be done with that. The, uh, if you look at other type of example of representation of old age, uh, if you go back in the history of the sculpture in Quebec especially, uh, of this old uh, religious culture that we, we used to have here in, our, in the churches in, in Quebec, uh, you have very often this theme here of the uh, uh, God the Father. Uh, and habitually, they are situated on the top of the altar. Uh, you have the main altar, you have a kind of a, a sculpture on the top, and then very much close to the ceiling, you will have this representation of God the Father floating in midair like this as if he was uh, watching what's happening downstairs uh, the, in, in a lower uh, area. Uh, and this, we don't know who was the sculptor of this, but he was a wonderful sculptor. It's, it's a beautiful piece. And, uh, and again, if you look at his forehead, of course, God the Father have wrinkles, and I guess all of them are good. <laughs> They're not supposed to be. He will not uh, uh, fall in water, uh, probably, no. Uh, another example I wanted to comment a little bit also, uh, because again, it's a kind of iconographic theme that is a little bit complex. It is this uh, old pulpit, I think, or chair, if you want, that was in the uh, uh, church of Bay Saint Paul. Uh, uh, today, you have a new church in Bay Saint Paul, but before, you have an old church there where this sculpture was. And now it's in the Musée uh, National des Beaux-Arts du Québec, in fact, it's in Quebec, but uh, it has been there for a long time. And then one, uh, uh, at a certain moment, also it was given to another parish, Saint-Urbain, and then finally it was divided in pieces and sold to many uh, collectors. And it's only recently that the museum have succeeded to uh, get all the pieces together. For instance, the panel was on the wall behind, uh, was separated from the kind of uh, what we call a cuve or a vat, if you want, a kind of tank in which the priests come to, to, uh, to preach. The and also the sculpture that you have on the side here, one here and one there, uh, were removed from there and were sold individually. Huh? Uh, this is not astonishing, but is what is astonishing that everything came back together in, at the museum. Uh, the team there behind, let's say the, the, the principal team, let's say, of the piece who is on the wall there is uh, a representation of uh, an apostle with a sword. When you see that, this has to be St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul is always the attribute, if you want iconographically, of St. Paul is the sword. Why? Because the sword, uh, it was the way he was uh, killed. He was a Roman citizen, 
and contrary to St. Peter was crucified, he had the privilege to have his head cut by, <laughs> by a, a sword instead of being crucified. So habitually, you have always representation of St. Paul is with, uh, is with the sword. Uh, and uh, he make also a kind of gesture, if you want. If you look at his hands, he's like this a little bit. Uh, and this is an allusion, of course, of the, his reaction on the way of Damascus. Uh, you, you know that the, he was first uh, prosecuting the Christians, and then suddenly on the way to Damascus, where he wanted to, to put in jail some Christians there, um, he saw suddenly you know, a voice, he heard a voice that tell him, Saul, Saul, why do you prosecute me? Uh, so he fell from his horse, and uh, he was uh, blind for a while, and then he became, as you know, the apostle by excellence uh, of Christianity. Uh, so that's, uh, but here, I, I, I think, is the most uh, discreet and the most <laughs> humble way to show uh, this thing just by one gesture. There's another detail that we don't see on the photo. It is that above him, there's two little clouds, uh, but we cannot see them. They are very, very uh, dim, uh, just a little bit uh, absolutely uh, traced with a minimum of, uh, of uh, intervention from the sculptor. And of course, these clouds is where the voice come from. Uh, this uh, theme of St. Paul being on the way of Damascus is, of course, have a, a long tradition behind and habitually is represented much more dramatically, especially by Caravaggio. Uh, what you see on the right is the same thing that I was describing, but you see his horse is, is really on the floor and the light come from mysteriously above, we don't know. And this picture is in the chapel, the Serazzi chapel in, in Santa Maria del Popolo in, Roma, in Rome. And uh, uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's uh, not on the wall that we see on the left, but on the other wall. Uh, and uh, it's always an interesting experience when you go to see these uh, old churches. They have a system of light in which uh, it lasts only two minutes. Huh? So you press. And then you look at the, at the Caravaggio, so, wow, this is fantastic. And then, boop, and then it's black like uh, pitch dark because they want to save the, the painting from too much uh, enlightenment. And too, but uh, anyway, so now you, you, you have, uh, and in, in the chapel, let's say the big picture uh, above the altar was done by Caracci, and also Caracci had the, the contract to make the, the ceiling, the vault. Uh, which was considered like the most important contract. And Caravaggio was younger. They gave him to do the two painting on each side. He, he did another one uh, that you see on the right that was refused because it was too complicated, too confused. You see on the, the right upper uh, portion, you see uh, Christ appearing to him and telling him the, the famous phrase, of, why do you persecute me? And then you have a soldier who seems to to be uh, trying to hold the, the horse. And uh, finally, you have St. Paul on the ground uh, with rather like an old man there. And so I, I think he, this picture was uh, refused, if you want. And he did the second one on the left, who is now in the chapel Cerasi. Uh, and uh, so this is a more traditional way to, to represent it. In, in the case of, uh, of Bayerge, of Francois Bayerge, of this thing, I think it's one of the less dramatic <laughs> representation of, of St. Paul on the way of Damascus that I know of. Uh, it's incredible. The rest of the, of the sculpture, let's see the, the bottom part, uh, you have a representation of Christ as preaching and also a representation of St. Peter. St. Peter and St. Paul are the two patron of the St. Paul Church, and that's why uh, they are represented there. The busts are one devoted to Christ and the other to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and they are uh, now, as I told you, all uh, together. Uh, you, see him, you see it here again uh, in different type of uh, photo. Uh, uh, the Christ is represented preaching because that's why he has his hands like this, uh, and St. Peter is on the side. There's another St. Peter that was also at Bay Saint Paul, but not on the, not on the pulpit, not on this uh, chair. It was uh, part of the decor. And why we know it's St. Peter? It is because of the, of the rooster. Uh, uh, again, it's an allusion to the gospel where Christ tell him, uh, you will uh, betray me uh, three times before the rooster will, will uh, sing twice, uh, or something 
like that. And uh, so the moment you see an old man with a rooster, th that's St. Peter. Uh, it's uh, again, this kind, it's, it's a way, this iconography is, is in a way function well when you know the symbols, <laughs> otherwise it's very strange to what the rooster is doing there. So if you don't know, if you, uh, if you have not been raised in this type of, uh, uh, of uh, culture, let's say it becomes, all this becomes very weird. But, uh, okay, so that's example, let's say the two examples I showed you of old sculpture in Quebec, in which, okay, the, uh, the idea of uh, representing old age could be uh, interesting, if it put in, in different contexts. And then, of course, when you go a little bit further in time, the, uh, the one who have been very, very enthusiastic about the subject is certainly Cesar Côté. Uh, uh, Marc Corel de Foix Suzor Côté, what a name, and uh, a name that he created there in Paris to uh, impress uh, the French there. And uh, Suzor was the name of his mother, and Côté was his name. Uh, and anyway, Marc Corel Côté, uh, that <laughs> made Suzor de Foix and all this, it's much better. And so he represented the whole pioneer of the region uh, where he was born himself in Artabasca. Uh, you know more or less where it is, it's like uh, a south shore of the St. Lawrence River, I would say between Quebec and Montreal, to more or less, in Victoriaville, in that region. And uh, one of the uh, personages that he liked and that he have uh, probably painted or draw maybe 30 times is this man here. It's, it's called Esdra Seer, uh, who was a kind of pioneer of the time. He was apparently also 82 when the painting, well, when the pastel, in fact, it's not a painting, it's a, it's a pastel were done in both cases. In one, on the left, you show him in his kind of uh, well-dressed, like for Sunday, let's say for, for going to mass. And in the other, on profile, uh, he, he is with the uh, working uh, type of shirt, let's say with a chemise a caro, like this, like typical of a, of a worker. And uh, the, the, the man was described at the time by some journalists who, who consulted uh, Suzor Cote and asked who he was. And, and uh, I just want to read you a little bit a, a kind of a description of, of the man. He says, uh, a, a journalist says, he was really an old authentic pioneer with a noticeable physiognomy. Suzor Cote painted him from all angles. Any museum of some consequence, both in Canada and in the United States, possesses one of his portraits. I made a lot of money with this old man, used to say Suzor Cote. Uh, his name was Ezra Seer, but people used to call him Finette, uh, because he was uh, uh, witty and, and having a, kind of a, his way, uh, which characterized him very well. He had a good sense of humor, his repartees were always fine and funny. With time, Suzor be, become quite fond of his model. The old man was telling us about the tough existence they had, their fight against the forests, and their misery when they came to settle in St. Sophie d'Halifax. Well, this is the old name of uh, Artabasca, with this region, having a soul belonging, their axes, and their courage. Uh, so the, uh, so th th that's uh, two portraits. I show you two more. Let's see, on one, on the left, he, he, he gave his age, uh, 82. And the other, it's called what's a, a lost profile. That means that uh, you see the, uh, the personage from the back, in a way, uh, and just uh, in profile, but as if it's almost lost. So if he turn his head a little bit more, you will not see him at all. Uh. And ag ag again, the, uh, he looks stern. He looks not too, too easy to deal with. And uh, apparently there was some uh, negotiation because it's very nice to make the portraits of these old guys, but you have to pay them huh? because during that time they do nothing. Um, so they, they were negotiating about. And uh, we were told a little anecdote about this in which I will read that in, in Joal because I don't think it's easy to translate in, in English. He said, c'est pas juste, Monsieur Côté. Vous me donnez 30 sous puis un paquet de tabac pour faire mon portrait Et il paraît que vous vendez ça deux à trois cents piastres. Il faut me payer plus. <laughs> OK. Alors, mostly, what, in short, what he says, he says, I heard that you sell my portrait for two, uh, three hundred dollars, and you pay me only 50 cents or something like that, and you give me a tobacco pouch. He says, you have to pay me more. <laughs> 
And uh, so that's what it means by finet, you know, this type of uh, guy who could negotiate and, and even with César Côté. Huh? And, and this, uh, so this is a kind of certainly a colorful personage and uh, he represent him many, like I said before, in many, many angles. And the problem that you have there, it is that the, the whole age is also a time when I would see nature take over freedom. Uh, uh, you could say almost a, a passage from spirit to thing in a certain way. I don't know if I dramatize it too much, but I would speak of a kind of uh, uh, reification of the spirit with old age. Uh, and this is one of the obsession of Rembrandt, and that's why I show Rembrandt now in this context, because Rembrandt, I've painted himself so many times, so I've seen himself, I said, from painting to painting, aging, and being like this more and more close to a thing, and less and less than a spirit, if you want. But he was conscious enough of this type of dialectic, let's say, between the two, these two poles, to say, no, the spirit has to transcend the, the, uh, uh, the failing of the body, if you want. Uh, and this is why, for instance, in this painting, in the back of him, uh, you have two big circles, uh, probably a kind of uh, a sketch for a, 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 a world chart uh, with, with the two hemispheres. Uh, but it's reduced just to two circles. It's painted at a time when people were beginning to say about his, his uh, talent and all that, that he was losing ground, that he was less good than before, things like that. But the fact that he could draw like this two perfect circles behind him show still a certain uh, mastery of his craft. Huh? Again, it is a way to say, no, even if I'm aging, even I see from one painting to the other this kind of uh, uh, overcoming of, uh, I would say, uh, the, the, the thing to, on the spirit, I'm still trying to transcend that and I'm still able to paint this, this perfect circle. And also it's an allusion, of course, to the so-called Giotto circle. Uh, you know the legend that tell by Vasari that uh, some people coming from the Pope and asking him to give uh, to the Pope some example of his talent, Giotto just traces a circle on, on a piece of paper and says give it to the Pope this and he will understand that I'm, I'm a very good painter. Huh? And of course the messengers thought he was laughing at him and all that. So it's, it's also eventually an allusion to this Giotto circle things. But, but the main idea is this, it is that you have uh, how when you represent, let's say old age, you can also suggest a, a, a kind of spiritual value. Huh? And if you go back to the uh, to the César Côté uh, series on Edouard Sear, you will see that, okay, this is the same idea also. He tried to show us something else than just an old man aging and disappearing, let's say, uh, will, will be soon be uh, dead and, and will be uh, no more. Uh, he tried to, um, to associate him with certain ideas, I will say. And this is what I call the spirit transcending the body, uh, with certain ideas. Uh, in the, uh, if, you, if you want, in, in, if you look at, at philosophy and you think of wh what it is, this idea, well, for instance, Plato will defend that ideas are closer to the soul. Huh? And if you can express some idea like the good, the unity, the, the, the perfection and things like that, you are closer to the soul. Huh? And, but here the ideas that uh, uh, Suzor Cote suggests are not of that nature, they're not lofty uh, philosophical idea. They are basically the idea of the people of 1910, 1920 here in Quebec trying to define a kind of nationalism, let's say, based on language. Of course, Monsieur Cyr spoke only French, based also on a certain history, like he says, he was telling us how it was difficult to cut the woods and to establish new grounds for, for planting, this kind of agricultural myth, if you want and also faith, huh? also religion. And all that. So these, these values are in fact what transcend the whole guy there. And that's what César Côté wanted to suggest. Not only that it's an old man, but it's also it represents certain values, certain collective value. The problem, of course, that when you, you define this value only in terms of collectivity like this, 
you uh, are diminishing the individual aspect of the man. Uh, you become a symbol, you become a type of something else. And uh, it's not sure that uh, we reach the, the transcendence of the Rembrandt painting. Uh, in Rembrandt, you have one individual claiming transcendence on the uh, decaying of the body. Here you have uh, the suggestion that all collectivity is expressed here in this bonhomme, you know, among other things, he is a symbol of a certain ideology that were uh, current in 1910 and 1920 when these pastels were, were drawn. Huh? And, uh, and in, in fact, uh, when you, you get this, the other representation of Esdras seal that you find in, in uh, in the work of Cesar Cote, go in the same direction also. For instance, here, he become the whole pioneer. Huh? So instead of calling him by his name, now he become a, a kind of symbol. He become a, a figure of the whole pioneer. And also, he is now on the way to be in bronze. Huh? When you are in idea, this is always threatening you. You know, you became in bronze. <laughs> you finish in bronze. Huh? If you became just uh, an idea or just something that stand for certain value, well, you could be suddenly transformed like this. And indeed, he will make this famous uh, portrait of him. You have the, the plaster cast on the left, and then you have the finished bronze on the right, in which you see this old guy again, uh, smoking his pipe and uh, in his uh, chair, and rocking chair. And on the, the, the kind of uh, basis, or, or the, the the, the base on which he is, you have certain the representation of the instrument they used to have uh, to cut the woods and to, to work in the, in the field. Huh? So uh, he's really like, like now become uh, transformed more and more in an, in an idea, I would say, huh? and no more. And that's why also he's called just the old Canadian pioneer without any uh, specification of what he is and, and what was the model used here. Huh? You, you have like I told you, there's many, many uh, drawings and like this charcoal of him again, they preparing for, for the sculpture that I just showed you. Okay. If we go closer to our time now with uh, uh, John Lyman, self-portrait here done in 1960 when I think he was 74 about uh, at that time. Uh, the first thing that struck me is the wrinkles had di disappeared. Uh, even if you, you show a very old man uh, himself, let's say, he's not interested in this kind of superficial type of things. I mean, metoposcopy will not be for him. <laughs> he, he just erased it completely. And he gave more a kind of sculptural type of uh, approach to his head, if you want. It's like a, really like a sculpture more, and with where what he stresses is volume, and also the intensity of the look. Huh? After all, he's a painter, so you want to, to show him like this. We have other uh, portrait of Lyman done at different stage of his life. For instance, a, a much more young Lyman here on the left uh, when he was 32. And then another one with a strange uh, drawing that uh, kind of uh, uh, happy or I don't know, a little bit juicif, we will say in French, uh, Lyman on, on, on the right, uh, where the wrinkle uh, reappear but um, the old metoposcopies used to make a difference between line and wrinkles. Uh, line was something that uh, happened to you when you laugh and when you cry and all this, but they are not permanent. Uh, they, it's just something that if you make a grimace or something, it will show on your face, but they are not permanent. And wrinkles, in the contrary, are there for, for, for good. And so here you could say he draw lines, but not wrinkles, really. And uh, mind you, when you have a photo of him about the time when he made these drawings, well, he's uh, like any man of his age with, with wrinkles also, and even with a bald head. Huh? The other important theme that you will have also uh, when painters deal with old age and masculine old age is the idea of melancholy. And, and this is... Uh, uh, let's say a team that will come again and again uh, in the representation of old man. Uh, uh, melancholy, oh, we, oh, I forgot about this, yeah. Well, let's see. Melancholy is, uh, is based on, uh, this idea of melancholia is based on a theory that go back to antiquity and uh, 
in which you have four humors or four liquid, if you want, in the body that have to be in right proportion if you want to be in good health. One is the black bile, so it was supposed to you have in the, in the liver something that will create this bile who will be black, and then you have a yellow one, and then you have phlegma, and then you have blood. Huh? And according to that, you have different type of temperament also. Huh? And here in Lavatel, uh, uh, picture that you have here, uh, he, he gives you uh, the, the four temperament uh, according to the four humors. Huh? So for instance, on the left, on the, on the top, you have the phlegmatic one. Then in front of him, you have the choleric one. Uh, he, he looks uh, not easy, an easy man to deal with. And then on the lower register, you have the, uh, the, the sanguine, the, the, the man in which the, the blood is the most important. And finally, the melancholic <laughs> on the right, uh, the lower, uh, lower corner, uh, who looks really depressed and things. Right? So it was linked to this idea that uh, we have if you have certain imbalance in this humor, you get this temperament. Huh? For instance, somebody who has too much uh, blood or too, uh, is too sanguine will, will become uh, uh, like the one on the left there. And if, in the contrary, it's the black bile that took over, and because melancholia, the word itself comes from the Greek, melas means black and cholia means bile. So it's really a, a kind of old medicine, let's say, that went through, uh, was repeated many, many times after. So for instance, even in this famous picture of Durer, representing the four ap apostles, if you want, you have St. John and St. Peter in the first one. Why it's St. Peter? Because of the key, of course. Uh, each time you see an old man with key, uh, it's St. Peter, and St. John is there with the, with the uh, red gown. So he is the one in which blood is more important, and St. Peter, who seems to be quiet and a little bit uh, more uh, gentle in the back, will be uh, more phlegmatic, if you want. And then on the other panel, you have St. Mark in the, in, the, in the back, who is the choleric one, who is the one who is uh, with raft and then more, more uh, and these are kind of very dark eyes. And you have St. Paul, again, with his words, uh, as you see. And uh, who, who is the melancholic? Because he looks at the public like this, but he prefers to be immersed in his own, in his own thought, and he doesn't want contact with, with the exterior. So even in the representation of apostle, this old system, let's say, of dividing the temperaments were also expressed in painting. Uh, and of course, uh, when you speak of melancholia, you, we always think of these famous engravings of Durer, uh, which have uh, as its main subject, the melancholia. Uh, you see this kind of uh, angel, uh, she angel on, on the right. And what is important there is this, this gesture that she's holding her head like this with uh, a, her, her hand on, his, on her uh, uh, jaw and uh, having her her elbow like this, uh, leaning on her knees in this case. But, but this is the typical gesture of melancholia, and you will see it in paintings or in sculpture after that will be repeated many times. Uh, and she has, she have on a, a raft of, uh, let's see, watercress around her head because uh, melancholia was supposed to be a type of illness, let's say, that dry you up, that you are very dry. So watercress is full of water, so it's a good idea to have this if you are depressed. Eh? You, you put a little crown of watercress. And then, but all the other symbol around her seems to be that she's uninterested in, in anything. Say you have a key, you have even her, her purse with money, uh, you have these poor dogs who are sleeping there with a thin like a, uh, like a rod, let's say, and, and, and you have, uh, and she's circled by all these strange uh, geometric form, let's say, and she seems not to be able to relate to anything outside of her. Uh, and then you have this little puto or this little angel near her on uh, sitting there and seemingly writing something. And this I've given a lot of trouble to interpretation, but what we think it is a representation of the imagination writing on, on, on the mind, if you want some ideas or some phantasm. phantasm huh? And especially melancholic, actually I have, have a kind of uh, violent sexual desire, uh, de desire that make them 
according to these uh, people uh, in the past, that made them difficult to grasp certain more spiritual value. Uh, so they make this little angel like that, like a cupido, uh, making allusion to, to love, if you want, writing in her mind some, um, I would say, dirty thoughts or something like that. Uh. And uh, so you have all, all this setting. And then suddenly on the wall, I don't know if you notice it on the wall, uh, just above her head, you have a kind of magic square there. Uh. Uh, I just reproduce it. And why we call magic? Because if you had it in every direction, it's almost the Sudoku of the time. Huh? You, you, you get always 34 uh, in every direction. And you get also at the bottom 15 and 14. This is the date of the engraving. Huh? So, it's a, so why a, a magic uh, square there in this context? It was um, belief that mathematics and the attention to numbers or to geometry could get you out of melancholia. Could you bring toward more spiritual type of think, of thought, uh, of thinking? And that's why it's there. Uh, it's in this context. And also, if you want, if you go back to it, you have all these above, all these symbols of death. In fact, see this bell, uh, this uh, kind of uh, hourglass also, and uh, this, this ladder goes to nowhere. All these symbols could be also of death. And finally, you have uh, an inscription where you read Melancholia 1, uh, and above it, a, a bat that holds it, uh, like this. And uh, why a bat there? A bat is an animal who is wonderful because according to the, uh, again, to the iconographer of the time, it is an animal that makes something who looks impossible. And of course, a mouse that fly is something that makes something impossible. And again, the suggestion is, is to get out of melancholia. You have to aim at something that looks impossible, like to, to go to mathematics and to go to more spiritual things and to get out of this. Huh? So it's a very type of complex uh, image in which you can see each detail has its signification. But what, I have, what is striking there is this, this gesture that you will find again and again to express melancholia. Uh, melancholia is associated with old age like this, like uh, I would say like greed that you saw before and like also um, Aristotle says the old men also are gossipy. Uh, they speak a lot, they are greedy, stingy, and also melancholic, uh, as if this is a, a good description of uh, people of my age. That's perfect. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And then again, you will see, uh, look on the right side of the image here in the middle, you have again the same gesture, a man who is uh, like this, and he, he's called hypochondriac. Well, hypochondri goes with melancholy also. And on the other side, you have um, uh, uh, a lover. And love also is associated with melancholy. Well, not at first, but uh, it may turn melancholic with time. But anyway, so it's very often associated both of them. And this is a, tra a treatise, The Anatomy of Melancholy, done by a man who is called Burton. Uh, in the 17th century, and on the cover, let's see, put everything that he could to suggest uh, the team. So on the top, you have two little landscape uh, on each side. Uh, one is associated with jealousy, I don't know, xenotopia, say jealousy, I don't know why this landscape in particular will, uh, will uh, but the title gives you that. And then you have in the middle, Democritus, who is a philosopher, who is very often associated with laughter. Uh, you have Heraclitus, who's always somber and I would say melancholic, but Democritus is very often uh, represented as laughing or as being happy and things. So again, he's like an anti-melancholic. Uh, uh, and the author himself put a portrait of himself in the bottom uh, of, uh, on the lower register, if you want, and he called himself Democritus Junior. Uh, as if he wants to get out of melancholy by writing about it. The book is incredibly uh, complicated. You have something like 13,000 quotation in this book. Uh, so this man was really depressed uh, to, to write, <laughs> <laughs> to go to his library like that, find little quotation from all authors of all the past and all that to write it. And it has been translated recently in French, but uh, I could not read that. This is incredibly... Uh, boring and all. And then the, you have in the bottom also 
two other uh, personages were associated with, a, with the sickness, in fact, and because of the anatomy of melancholy, it's, uh, it's like a doctor approach. Huh? And he, he put um, a superstitious on, on the left, uh, a man on his knees with a rosary. And of course, he's Protestant, Monsieur Burton. Huh? So a Catholic is uh, with his rosary, sort of name melancholic. It's uh, something, uh, some bugs in his head. Huh? And on the other side, you have um, uh, a furioso or some, somebody, a uh, uh, man completely crazy who is in chain and attached there. And finally, and at the bottom, you have representation of two plants, the borage and the elebor, who were supposed to be um, uh, used for, uh, uh, let's say, healing the, the melancholy. Huh? And so, so you have this kind of huge tradition uh, of this representation of melancholic people associated with old age. Uh, what happened now in, in uh, Canadian art? Let's say we left the, the other gentleman there. I, I, uh, I tried to find an example of that, and then I find this one really weird a little bit. Uh, it's a portrait of Jacques Cartier, uh, the discoverer of Canada, done by a man who is called François-Xavier Berlinguet. Uh, Berlinguet is a sculptor. He was a pupil of uh, Thomas Bayerger. So uh, this is a great tradition, let's say, in Quebec sculpture. And he was also the master of uh, Jean-Baptiste Côté and, and, and uh, Jobin and people like that. So he's in the, I would say, the very hand of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And he made this statue of uh, Cartier leaning on his hand like this, uh, with a white beard, as if he was already an old man, and with the kind of a little bit melancholic state, he wanted to have it on the top of the market in Quebec, huh? because there, there was a market there established at the time, it was called Le Marché Jacques Cartier, so he, he, so he did it, but the city refused to have his culture, they didn't like it, I don't know. And uh, so he put it on his own house. Huh? So for a long time, it was on the top of the house. And because it was to be seen from below and above, he, he put the head too big a little bit huh? because he thought, OK, people will look like this from, from uh, below. And I have to enlarge the head a little bit. And that's why probably he looks older than, than normally. And uh, then finally, it was uh, bought by many people, and it ended up in 1976 in the Museum of Quebec, uh, uh, in between having been restored in, in, the, in brackets in an horrible fashion, people repainted in and in different color and things. But the uh, Berlingue was certainly uh, taking his inspiration for a painting uh, from a painting by Hamel that I show you on the left who himself copied a painting by this Francois Ries. Uh, and this is, in fact, the most, I would say, common image we have of Cartier. The only problem is these images have the, uh, are from the 19th century and are based absolutely on no fact. Uh, they are completely imaginary, but they were powerful enough to, to be in all, I remember in my childhood, for instance, the and the Histoire du Canada, and this was the portrait of Cartier we had there. You have even a stamp, I think, with, uh, with an engraving uh, in, uh, inspired by this. So who was this Francois Ries? He was a French painter, uh, mostly unknown, but worked in Saint-Malo. Uh, and Saint-Malo, of course, was the place where Cartier was born. And because of that, they hired him to make a pseudo-portrait of Cartier, imagine it. And then you see that the gesture he is not exactly a melancholic gesture. It's more something with meditative, huh, who holding his bear like this. Huh? And it's, it's Berlinguer who transform it in a kind of melancholic sculpture by making him an old man instead of a relatively young one here, and having his kind of gesture much more pronounced, much more close to the, uh, the, the stereotype, if, if you want, of, of melancholy. Uh, and here is one of the many, many engravings done after Ries, after Amel, and uh, distributed in every context that you could imagine. Uh. So we change a little bit of this look. The, the problem it is that uh, it's what we call a faux portrait historique. Uh. It's like uh, it's done in 19th century, at a moment when I would say the um, nationalist movement needed badly to have uh, an history. Uh. You know that in oh, Canada we speak, uh, uh, in French, we say, ton histoire est une épopée. Huh? 
And uh, I remember little kids uh, saying, ton histoire est une des pas pires. Huh? <laughs> Your story is one of the not too bad one. <laughs> and the, um, and instead of a, a puppy. The, uh, and, and then so the, the need to have a figuration of all these great men, let's say Champlain and all this, uh, I've created, the, the need was there. And of course, uh, these people were answering this need by creating this pseudo uh, uh, portrait. Uh, here, on the other hand, you have a much more uh, closer to the stereotype of melancholy in this uh, uh, beautiful picture, again, by Lyman, who, who is called the Arabic philosopher, in which he held his, his hand like this on his, uh, exactly like in the melancholic uh, uh, picture that I show you. And in the case of Lyman, of course, probably the uh, intermediary is not so much Durer right away, but you could imagine also Van Gogh uh, in, in between. Uh, uh, Durer, but in between, closer to him, Van Gogh. This is the, uh, one of the very last picture that Van Gogh painted. He will kill himself a few weeks after having painted that. It's a portrait of Dr. Gachet. The people, uh, the nice people who, who uh, took Van Gogh toward the, in Auvers uh, in, in, at the end of his life. And uh, he, he associated him, him with two uh, novel by Les Frères Goncourt that you see, uh, the yellow novel, which really are modern art, uh, modern novels in, in Van Gogh picture, and with a plant with a foxglove in front of him. And then again, the same type of gesture of uh, discouragement of melancholia, if you want, associated with uh, an old guy. And he says that uh, Gachet was very close to him uh, in his correspondence with his brother Theo, he says uh, because he felt the misery of modern life, of, of what we have around the, us. And I guess Lyman also, by quoting more or less this picture uh, in his own style, was also referring to the same type of idea. Uh, not very rejoicing, <laughs> but uh, this is, I think, uh, these two themes, that, uh, maybe there's others, but uh, that what struck me, that you could speak about old age. And you will see when we will deal last, uh, next time with uh, representation of age uh, woman, uh, you will have a completely different type of context. Uh, because first of all, the theme is rarer uh, because of the uh, male sexism of most of male painters. Uh, they, they prefer to paint young women. Uh, but so the theme is rarer, but also the, the value stress are different. Okay, so we will deal with that next time. Thank you.